I'll gather my men. Go there and retrieve Anna. Ever play Gwent? I do. And what's more, I usually win. I didn't think I'd ever see this video come back onto this channel. This is the nucleus of the Brickmaker channel. Witcher content and this video specifically. This video took me weeks to make. And after weeks of uploading it, it had 20 views. So in an effort to protect my pride and ego, I took the video down and accidentally, well not accidentally, but I did delete it from the channel, but lost the original file. I then found the original file and decided that I want to bring this video back. I have edited it over again because the first time I did it wasn't great. It just all blended together. There was no sections, there was no cutting, there was no indication. And I had also recorded it with no microphone, just into my phone, into the recorder app, and I airdropped them over to my computer. It was very interesting listening to it all back. It was yeah, about six months ago when I made this video. It took me probably a month to make, and six months ago I, uh, I thought that I'd lost it. But here we are. I am bringing you guys what I believe is all the Witcher games, top three hardest boss battles. What will happen is this video will go through The Witcher 1, The Witcher 2 and The Witcher 3. In all three of those games I will rank my first, second and third most difficult boss battle that you can encounter. And then at the end I will have my official top three. The top three from all of them. I want to give a big thank you to my Discord. I've mentioned to them a few times about making new videos and they've always been very encouraging, saying make whatever you want and I'm sure people will watch. So we'll see how this video goes. I wasn't able to find my original thumbnail for it but my god there was no way I was going to use that again. I went through about 4 thumbnails and every one of them I believe was as bad as the last. It was one of those videos I remember feeling, oh I'm so proud of it, I can't believe it, this is so good. And then I watched it back and I was like, oh my god, this is downright awful. So yeah, without any further ado, let's get straight into The Witcher 1. The Witcher 1 is a hidden gem of a game. With its enhanced edition, you were able to play it in third person. And that gives it a very unique and fun style of playing. It also expands a lot more on the Geralt character. This takes place right after the final book and it also introduces the most important character in the franchise. Bop, bop, bop. Greetings. Those five seconds right there was enough inspiration for me to name this channel The Brickmaker and to make my icon a bald man. So yeah, although you guys have enjoyed a lot of Fallout content, and believe me, I love making Fallout content. I have a Fallout tattoo. It was the second tattoo I ever got as a wild wasteland right on my, my underarm. The Witcher, however, was the actual inspiration for this channel to be made. But let's talk about me. Let's get into our first boss, the Beast. Not to be confused with Mr. Beast or your uncle's nickname. The Beast is a character that you face right in the first section of the game. You're on the outskirts of Vizima. Vizima is the capital city of the Northern Realms. You are suffering from amnesia and you're looking for some people that just attacked your castle. However, on the outskirts of this town, you find many colourful and wacky characters. You know, the kind of guys that murder their own brothers, do horrible things to women. And um, yeah, yeah, the original Witcher game was a lot darker than The Witcher 3. And God, that is saying something because The Witcher 3 is dark. The story of The Beast is it was a dog that was mistreated, murdered and its vengeful spirit came back for revenge. I mean, damn, talk about a, a motivation for revenge. You are first introduced to The Beast when you watch a young small child running for his life well, the person that's been looking after him and raising him gets eaten by the beast. Now the reason the beast gets third on my list, even though it's an early game boss, is just due to the difficulty of it at the time that you're playing. 
Now you can battle it in two different scenarios. You can side with a witch called Abigail and scorn all the townsfolk for being bad people. Or you can side with the townsfolk and take out the witch, who's not like a great person but also isn't a terrible person either. The first time I played this I obviously sided with the witch. However, when I was playing it I was unable to beat the beast with only her. I had to reload an old save and go back and side with the townsfolk so you had more support when fighting it. There isn't many games that have made me do that. I generally had fought it so many times I didn't believe I was able to beat it. I didn't think I was ever skilled or I must have missed a lot of side quests to not be high enough level to fight it. And it caused me to pick a decision for Geralt that I didn't believe was right. So it's a lot of praise for an early game boss. Going back and replaying The Witcher 1 now, I can pretty much beat it first time. But the first time playing the game, I was unable to. So yeah, the beast got number 3. Moving swiftly on to number 2. And this boss comes a lot deeper into the game. For anyone who doesn't know the story too well, you're chasing down a Zeracanian mage who attacked your castle. Now the closer and closer you start getting to him, the more he starts slipping away and summoning more powerful creatures. The scariest one in my opinion is the Koshche. The Koshche is this big massive crab spider nonsense and because you're a lot later in the game you are a lot better at the game you're a lot stronger you have a lot more skills the Koshche still took me a lot of different attempts to take him out however because you're a lot more experienced by this point it's not I would say it took less attempts than the beast but it's one of those things where you can just appreciate the difficulty of the character. Making it a very easy number two on my list. Now I know what you're thinking guys. What could be number one? Could it be the huge Zugal that you can fight in the sewers? Could it be the Grand Master? Could it be the Lovecraftian Dagon? Or even the ghost of the great King Eridan, the leader of the Wild Hunt? When playing this game for that video, I truly thought, where did I find the most frustration? Where did I have my most difficulty? And the beast was an obvious one. The Koshche deserved it on pure reputation alone. But the real number one for the Witcher 1 game is the Yachtespore. Now, anyone who's played this game, played the Witcher 3, you'll be looking at me like, uh, Brick? This is a standard enemy and all of you who have really played it and not just played The Witcher 3 will be like yeah, yeah you're totally right Brick. Screw the Actress Boar, I hate everything about it. No matter what point you come towards these things in this game, they are still able to completely melt through all of your health. Cool characters like the Professor cannot even compare to the great power of the actual spores. I remember the first time ever going through the swamp area. I remember going into a random cave just outside Vasima and just being absolutely melted to pieces by this thing. I don't think there was any point that I was able to take one of these out comfortably. I generally remember having to run around and try drag wyverns to fight them for me because at one point you have to get a trophy for them. And despite all the different cards that we've spoken about in this video, the Koshche, the Beast, there's no doubt on my mind that the Atchaspor has given many, many Witcher fans of the first game huge issues. I mean, no matter what you're doing, even when you're speaking to all these important characters, learning more about the Eternal Fire, they're just still there. They're always there lurking in the background. Now, I do want to take this small section to recommend anyone to go back and play The Witcher 1. The storyline, the characters, although being a little bit goofy at times, I was blown away by how much fun I had going back and playing. If you've never played any Witcher game, you should definitely play The Witcher 3 first. That's what got me into the series. And they're planning to do a remake of The Witcher 1 as well. Now, obviously, you don't have to just wait for that. You can go play this game now. It's very much playable in 2024. There it is! There it is! It's just always watching. 
But other than my PTSD, that is the end of The Witcher 1. Let's get into The Witcher 2. The Witcher 2 out of the entire trilogy is probably the biggest left turn that the games ever take. Now people think of The Witcher 3 and they think open world RPG. And obviously The Witcher 3 is a huge open world. And The Witcher 1 also has its moments. But The Witcher 2 takes a much different approach. It puts everything into a focused story campaign with diverging paths and important consequences. And although it loses a little bit because it doesn't have its open world, and it does feel a little bit more restrictive in terms of your own personal decisions, there's no getting away that this is a brilliant game. Again, I'd recommend anyone play this. This, is a, this feels very much like a 2006 Xbox 360 game, you know? It's simple, it's focused, the characters are likeable, the voice acting is fantastic, there's customization, and most importantly, there's a lot of interesting boss to fight. Now you might be a little bit surprised by this, but the the one 2 free list already kind of goes out the window um, at The Witcher 2. Like I've been saying, The Witcher 2 is a linear campaign game. So whenever you're fighting these bosses, you are pretty much exactly where you're supposed to be. So for 3 and 2, I just put the Crane and the Draug. The Crane is a very fun fight. It uses a completely different feature than any other boss in the game. And the Draug does have a good jump in difficulty. There's a lot of time based events here as well. There's sections where you've got to hide and wait for arrows to stop falling. It feels like a nice change of momentum and a nice change of speed as you're playing through the story. But the reason why they're both pretty much sharing 3 and 2, like it's, it's hard to divide them, is because the game is obviously making sure that at this point, if you've not done any side quests, you're still at a position where you can beat these characters. Which, for the time that this game was released, makes a lot of sense. They don't want huge difficulty barriers for new players. However, I think they only figured that out halfway through development, because the first level fight is unbelievably difficult. When I first thought of this video, it started with The Witcher 3, and I started going back through the previous games. The Witcher 3 has tons of enemies, lots of diversity, and huge jumps in difficulty. The Witcher 1 also has a little bit of that as well. But like I said, The Witcher 2 tries to make sure you're ready. I was not ready to fight Lefo here. Lefo is unbelievably powerful and the game has no intention of telling you what to do. Now obviously I said the first Lefo fight and by the time you're fighting Lefo at the end of the game, it's, um, it's not as difficult because you know what you're doing and you're more comfortable with the character. Also, if you're taking Lefo out at the end of the game and not making sure he can get into your Witcher 3 save, what are you doing? Are you a monster? But that doesn't change the fact that by the time you're fighting Lefo the second time, you're much more than capable. Fighting Lefo here? My god, you have to practice over and over again. Lefo is difficult. All of his signs are much more advanced than yours and you more or less can't even strike him until certain points. He has an unlimited Gwen shield. I mean, if you've seen him in The Witcher 3, you know just how powerful a character he is. And even by the end of the fight, you're not even allowed to beat him. You get his health to a certain point, and he just whips your butt anyway. Like, there's nothing you can do. He knocks you into a corner and goes, that's it done, I'm going to spare you. Pray that I don't come back and finish you off. And also, God, don't you just love his character build? What were they going for? I mean, he is just well and truly the biggest steroid guy in the world. And such a fascinating character. Honestly, The Witcher 2 is a fascinating game. There's a lot of characters that we're supposed to see in The Witcher 3, but there was a lot of time issues at the end of The Witcher 3's development. So there's a lot of potential for people to come back to a Witcher 4 game, maybe a Witcher spin-off game. And all that was started here in The Witcher 2. 
I feel like it's the forgotten Witcher game and I highly recommend any of you go back and play it. Now it's time to move on to the big daddy, the big kahuna, the Witcher 3. Now, The Witcher 3, for the majority of you out there, will be your introduction into the series. This game has, I think, last time I checked, over 150 boss fights, technically. And a combat system that is so well refined and so smooth and fun to play. I mean, look at me holding down square. That is innovative. On top of that, we have returning villains like the King of the Wild Hunt, Eridan and arguably the greatest DLC that was ever released to any game. I know people are discussing now that Shadow of the Urtree might be better than Blood and Wine, but I don't think anything will ever beat just how fantastic Blood and Wine was as a DLC. I mean, it is just a fully fledged game. But we're not here to discuss DLCs or the story of The Witcher 3, we're here to discuss the most difficult boss fights. And similar to some previous entries on this list, number 3 is Ignis Fatus. And this boss fight gets on this list because simply the level that you can obtain this quest and start this quest, you are not even close to ready for it. You gather this quest in the swamps of Velen, and when I say the first time I ever played The Witcher 3, I had to hide in the corner and cheese my way with a crossbow to take him out. In this Fatus has no right to be this difficult. You'll fight many different enemies just like him. He's like a fog ghoul. But for some reason he has unbelievably high damage. And I think what the most important factor about him is that when you're fighting him at this level you don't have nearly enough tools to be able to combat all these different phantoms. Not only that, he's probably the first boss where you start introducing the poison feature. The Swamp of Velen is crawling with tons of difficult enemies, and Ignis Fatus is no exception. Now obviously going back and playing it on a new game plus or something like that, he's no issue at all. You can usually take him up with one attempt. But anyone doing a regular new game and hasn't played the game before, believe me, you'll want to make sure you're a little bit over leveled for this fight. Moving into number 2 and we're entering a DLC. Not Blood and Wine, the previous DLC that got so much high praise, we're here for Hearts of Stone. Now this is another contender for brilliant DLCs. I really think the biggest drawback of Hearts of Stone is that it's not Blood and Wine. I think that's what the biggest criticism you can give it. It's not as good because it's up against the best possible DLC ever made. But it does introduce the best character in the game, Gontro Dim. I, I adore Gontro Dim in this game. He is one of the most fascinating and interesting, yeah, villains that you'll ever meet in any Witcher game. And all I want to do is learn more about him. But we're not here to fight Gontro Dim, we're here to fight Olgierd von Everick. Specifically, the first time you fight him, outside the Burning House. Now at this point you're looking at Ogier just like any normal villain. But we quickly learn that Ogier is not a normal villain. He is downright immortal. Meaning that all the hard work we just put into that fight was for nothing. And it gives us a lot more of an insight into the true power of Gonar. He's not just making small wishes like a genie or a djinn. He is granting immortality. Now if the huge frog at the start of the DLC wasn't enough and fighting an immortal man that you chop his head off with, then meeting people at the caretaker will also scare the britches off you. The Witcher 3 offers so much in terms of bright and beautiful landscapes, but Hearts of Stone really drag the game down into the dark, misty, with the hint of red fire in the background. It well and truly deserves its place as a great DLC and Ogit deserves his place as number 2. Moving on and we are finally entering Blood and Wine. The Blood and Wine main story sees Geralt being hired as a detective. He has got to find the Beast of Beauclair, a 
and the word beast has came up a lot in this video. It turns out it was a higher vampire called Detlaf. Someone that we've got to know throughout the game, and some we've got to understand. And also someone who's a blood brother to Regis, a book character who is also like a brother to Geralt. Without spoiling too much, by the end of the DLC, the vampires are declaring war on the humans. And you got to decide if you're going to let Detlef go or if you're going to have to fight him. If you decide to fight him, you will be introduced to the most difficult boss fight in the entire Witcher 3. The battle with Detlef at Teshan Mutna, which turns out to be the area where the vampires first entered Beauclair. This battle has many stages and Detlef transforms throughout the fight and we get to see the true power of the higher vampires. Now we've been learning all the way through this DLC that higher vampires cannot be killed. This puts him completely above Eredin, who a lot of people probably thought would be on this list, but genuinely I did not think he was worthy to be here. Detlef is truly the most difficult fight in The Witcher 3. With that, I will give my final rankings. Now I believe the most simple way to do this would just be 1, 2, 3, and just order all number ones from all the games. However, I don't think that would be very fair or accurate. I generally don't think any of the boss fights from The Witcher 1 deserve to be on this list. In terms of battles that deserved real strategy, proper preparation, and a fair and just system, I believe that I would rank it number three, Ogre Von Everick from The Witcher 3. Number two, I would leave it to be Lefo from The Witcher 2. And number one, I believe it would be Detlaf. If you guys agree, please leave a comment down below. Tell me what your favorite Witcher game is. And if you guys really disagree, please give me your list down below as well. Leave a like and a comment if you enjoyed The Witcher content. And let me know if you want me to do more stuff like this. You can still expect the weekly Fallout challenges. This week I've been on holiday, so there hasn't been a new challenge uploaded, but you can expect one next week. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next video.